Hey guitar buddies, Martin Smith back with another video. I want to say hi to all the guitar community, the Van Halen people, Brown Sound Tone Chasers and just general YouTube guitar nutballs. This one is a deeper dive this time. Um, turns out there's a massive guitar community of uh, Brown Sound Tone Chasers out there, so you know who you are, you're all nuts, and I love you all. A couple of thank yous before we get going. I want to say a big thanks to Niels Lozoa. He allowed me to use a few uh, photos in the first video and was very cool about what I'd done. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Jazz Obrecht for allowing me to use a snippet of Eddie's interview with him. So there's some audio coming up. And uh, thank you to everyone who's liked and subscribed. It makes it all worthwhile that people out there are interested in the same stuff. We're all chasing the same magical sound. Um, so without further ado, this is going to be an expanded version. Uh, we're going to go into more concepts, more playing, some more sort of secrets, tips, techniques, and just more of that funky stuff. Okay, enjoy. <laughs> Let's kick off with defining what we mean by the brown sound. So Eddie used this term to refer to a couple of different things at different points. Um, in one interview, he said it was Alex's snare drum sound, which, like, think of it this way. Like, Eddie's a good brother. He was getting all the attention, and Alex, although a phenomenal drummer, he wasn't getting the limelight as much. And I think Eddie wanted to create a myth for Alex that he was the origin of the brown sound. But this is only in one interview. So in all the other ones, Eddie clearly says that the brown sound is his idea of a, not a loud sound, but a, a warm spread, a warm brownish sound. Uh, here are the words of the man himself. Yeah, there's a thing I call a, a warm, a warm brown sound. You're talking about a brown sound. Yeah, a, a warm, rich, tony sound. Uh -huh. Okay, you still with me? So... We know what the brown sound is, it's Ed's guitar sound. It sounded dramatically different to anything that happened before it. As soon as Ed came on the scene, it was like, what is that? Okay, I did promise we're gonna get a bit deeper and a bit more nerdy on this one, so here we go. First of all, like without the work of Jim Gowstead, Pete Thorne and those guys, we'd have nothing really to assess the components because they've gone there and they found the authentic pieces of gear and they put them together in the right way and they're playing them with good attack and the right sort of feel. Um, and yet we're still not there. We're still not going, that's it. Call off the hunt. We've got it. Um, and I think the reason is because there's somewhere, there's an extra gain stage that's creating that saturation and those harmonics, um, the compression, that whole thing, the extra sizzle. Uh, so that's what we're looking for. And I'm trying to find ways of getting it basically. Uh, so it's prompted this slaving um, debacle. Like I'm not saying he definitely slaved. Can I just have that on the top of the banner at the top of the video? I'm not saying he definitely slaved, but he had the equipment to do it. He had the know-how to do it. And there was some funny stuff going on with his amp that means at some point he definitely did do it. Look at it this way. We're trying to cook a fantastic meal. It's an analogy for the brown sound. Just go with it. All right. And the uh, ingredients all have to give the flavor of that meal. But if you don't have enough salt and you have more soy sauce, you can sort of balance the whole thing and end up at something that tastes the same, theoretically. Um, I'm not using the original equipment. I have owned Plexis, I've owned lots of Marshalls, and they never got me anywhere near to Ed Sound. So I kind of just went, hmm, okay, I'll look for other avenues, people who've like excelled in building amps. And that's where I came across the David Brayhead because he knows what it sounds like and he knows how to make an amp do that. 
So like that was it. I was really happy with that. Uh, still not getting the extra sizzle, the extra sustain. And then I remembered slaving because I've done it in the past years ago. Um, and I gave it a crack and uh, ah, things happened, you know, that junk, that chord, it has to sort of regenerate. It's like, it gets bigger. And like most chords, they get quieter as they sustain. But in, in Running With The Devil, junk, it just grows. It just feels like it could go on forever. Okay. All right. So that's why, <laughs> that's why I think the slaving was happening. Okay. So if it's a recipe, it means that um, your ingredients might be different to somebody else's ingredients, but a skilled chef can still put them together and make it taste a certain way. And some of the components you might not realize are important are, so for instance, we talk about the volume pop on the guitar. Um, there's a difference between a 500 and a 250 value on the sound. I'm putting the graphs uh, onto the video now, so you should be able to see that. And you'll see that the 500k has a resonant peak which crests higher so it means it's got more treble um, than the 250k version and in the 250k you can see the treble's been smoothed off a bit now you've got to appreciate that um, a humbucker is usually strapped or it was designed to be strapped to a pickup selector then to a volume and a tone and then the output jack so there's a few components there and each one adds some capacitance and the cable so essentially you're taking off high end with the the circuitry of the guitar ed didn't have any circuitry apart from the volume pop so you're going direct it's like uncooked it's kind of like really raw and high frequency spiky that's a thing and it's a thing you've got to know what you want to do with so you might want to reduce the value of the pot to take away some of the, the peaky treble or you might say, well, you know what, I've got a dull amp, so I want that peaky treble. Those are all cool things. Like you might be using 40 foot of cable and it might be sucking up all your tone. So having a brighter pickup output is a good thing in that case. And it might just keep the clarity going through your signal chain. <laughs> This is where Ed was the Don, right? He would adjust to taste. Now I'm saying it was the slaving. Maybe, maybe it was his echoplex. There's talk that Ed's echoplex, especially around the fair warning period, might have had the Dynacomp compressor module in it. Now what the Dynacomp compressor module is, is basically it's a compressor circuit out of a pedal and they started putting it into the echoplexes. It's quite likely that Ed owned one of these and it might be a change in sound in the Echoplex in later albums. Now that wouldn't answer Van Halen 1, so you can kind of like discount it from the Van Halen 1 ingredients, but uh, it certainly could have been there for Fair Warning. Maybe that's the reason for the dark sound on Fair Warning. Okay, we're gonna go there, strap yourself in. We're talking about the cab now, the 412 that Ed used on Van Halen 1. So folklore is starting to have it, that there were two JBL speakers in the top of the cab that recorded Van Halen 1. Why? Why, why are people saying this? I think the reason is because of the two mics that you can hear when you listen to the split tracks. One sounds brighter, one sounds less bright. So people are thinking, oh, it's a different speaker. There's no other evidence to suggest that he ever used JBLs on a recording. That's a bold thing to say, Martin. Yeah. Um, but I've done my homework and I'm Feeling fairly confident? Uh, you're never 100% on this, but um, feeling fairly confident that um, the only time you saw a cab with JBL's near sunset sound. So you might have seen the photo of David Lee Roth sat on top of uh, some cabs outside sunset sound in the parking lot. And there's actually an arm creeping around the back of the, uh, the cabs to hold the cab in place so Dave doesn't fall, which I think is really cute or evil. That's the only time we see a cab with two dome caps like the silver caps um, in any of his cabs. So bear in mind on Van Halen 1 when you can see the speaker in Don Landy's photo uh, you can see the uh, Tolex has been ripped off 
and it's got a black uh, baffle board. Um, more than that, you can't really see, but you can tell that it has a wooden strip across the middle section where the angle happens. And um, I've been looking through the photos of Ed's cabs and I was terrified that I would find an angled cab with the wooden strip and two silver speakers on stage with him at some point. Um, and I didn't. I only found the naked Tolex cabs with the strip going down with greenbacks in it. It's my contention that that cab with the silver dust caps was just a prop. And also we don't see any other shots of Ed using silver dust caps. It's very unlikely that this is the extra sound. I'm just not buying it. I mean, it makes sense if you don't know the Ed miking technique. Oh, the Ed miking technique. Yeah, the Ed miking technique. I'm going to show you it. All right, here we go. So this is how you get two sounds off one cab. You're miking two separate speakers. Um, this is a secret of Don's, actually. He doesn't tell people, and the only other engineer who found it um, who's discussed it, said he's never told anyone before as well. He's one of the Sunset Sound engineers. Uh, his name's Bill. Can't remember Bill's second name. I'm going to find out Bill's second name. Bill Jackson. So engineer Bill Jackson um, took a peek in during the diver down sessions at sunset and he had a look at uh, the speaker cab and worked out what Don was doing with the mics. He's only ever just said this for the first time quite recently. And what he said was two mics on two speakers. So each speaker gets its own microphone. One is pointing straight in at the seam between the dust cap, the middle section and the cone the flared outer section. So where they meet, one microphone points at that. That's going to be a fairly dry, direct kind of, you know, regular sound. Now the other one's incredible. So everyone's always said you angle the mic, but nobody's ever said what you're angling it towards. So you're actually angling it to exactly the same place. But instead of looking directly at the dust cap, think of the cone as flaring out like that. Now what you want to do is aim at the cone. So that's the thing, is you've got two microphones looking at different places on the speaker, both very sort of tonally picked places. One is going to sound brighter, one is going to sound darker. And then you can adjust those to taste. Um, this is what I think the explanation for the increased uh, top end on one of those mics that we hear in the split tracks of Eddie's. Uh, it's just one mic sounds brighter and one sounds darker because of the place on the speaker they are pointing at. And that's the explanation for the two different sounds. Like if you if you EQ one mic compared to another mic when they're both on the same sound source, then what you get is uh, comb filtering and frequency shifting, which can change the phase relationship. So the thing about phase is you want the phase to be identical on both mics. The phase is the timing basically uh, of the sound waves and you want those sound waves to both coincide to bolster themselves rather than to start subtracting sound so when both mics are hitting at exactly the same moment that's when you get the most in phase sound and that's the strongest sound you can get um, and so if you were to start EQing both of those signals separately you'll withtract uh, you'll subtract phase and you'll get a weaker sound so what Don would do, would he would get two different tonal qualities out the guitar speakers, um, but perfectly in phase. And then you can just fade up those faders to get it brighter or darker, dependent on the mix and the tune. All right, let's have a listen to these two mics separately. So one of the mics, the angled mic, is the one that's um, more diffused sounding, less bright, less direct. And then the uh, the straight mic, that's getting a very direct, bright sound. Um, so he let's hear them one at a time. And then we'll hear them together.
So what you heard there was the angle mic sounding a more diffuse, uh, warmer sound. There was the straight mic sounding really bright. And then the composite of the two, which is the, the final total. Um, and this is the way Don did it back in the day. He didn't EQ the guitar dramatically, I don't think. Um, because there's always sonic artifacts with EQ. So here's the thing. If we've discounted JBLs from being part of the formula, making the sizzle, um, and it has to be because they wouldn't make extra compression or sustain. JBLs aren't compressed, sustainy speakers. They're pretty fierce. They're pretty spiky. Maybe spike is the wrong word, but they're pretty bright and fierce. So I don't think that's going to be giving us what we're hearing. And for that reason, I'm saying they're not in the amp. They're not in the speaker. They weren't on VH1. I don't think they're on any Van Halen album. All right, I've got a bit of a news flash for you, courtesy of Niels Lozauer and, and his Van Halen contacts. So if you don't already know, Niels Lozauer was the photographer that took all the classic Van Halen pictures from 78 to maybe 79 to about 84, 85. He went on tours with them. He did their studio shots. Um, and he basically ran with the band and he was like operating as uh, the visual fifth member, I guess. And so obviously Neil's like got a lot of Van Halen contacts and a lot of confidants and sources of information. And I asked Neil about uh, if anybody knew about the guitar cabs and stuff like that. And he got in touch with Doug Anderson. Doug Anderson runs a Van Halen. Hey, Doug, if you're listening, um, he runs a Van Halen museum, I think in Pasadena. And he's got a lot of kit that belonged to Ed and the band. And one of the things he knows about is the speaker cabinet. This is what Doug says. He says that Ed really preferred the straight-fronted cabs. He wasn't into the angled cabs as much. And so um, if ever he broke a speaker, if he blew a speaker in one of the straight-fronted cabs, he'd take one out of the top of the angled cab and stick it in the straight-fronted cabs. That would leave you a hole in the angled cab. And what he would do is he'd repopulate those empty holes with Radio Shack silver dome speakers. They have an orange chassis, black magnet, silver dome cap. They look like a JBL, but they're not a JBL. And um, essentially those were just dummies. They weren't used sonically. They were just making up the numbers. So I think that's pretty good, pretty conclusive. He liked greenbacks. He said in interviews he didn't like JBLs. And this checks out with pretty much what everyone's saying who knew the, the guys. <laughs> Let's look at a few pieces that are going to help you get closer to the sound. Let's kick off with the plectrum. So Ed used nine gauge strings. I don't think you can get them anymore. It's like nine to 42 on this one. Um, pure nickel, because that matters. And um, if you use a heavy gauge pick, which I would assume would be good for Edward because it's fast music, yeah? You can make your guitars go out of tune really easy. So this isn't what he used. One of these thin little things is what Ed used, apparently. Not particularly a red one. I think Herco's were his favourite. But something dead flexible, right? And what it gives you is it gives you this sort of a... this recoil off the bounce, which is kind of useful. It allows you to bounce off the strings is generally you want to bury the pick about that much. And 
and then you can get a little bit of your thumb in there, uh, get some harmonics and some, some growl um, without working it too much. And all that sort of stuff just happens easier if your pick's a little bit buried. I know Ed was into this thing with the middle finger. And I sort of do that, but I tend to back it up with the first finger or vice versa. You know, with the thin pick, you can actually strike the strings pretty aggressively. And you don't whack the strings out of tune, so that's a top tip for you. Next thing I want to talk about is setting up the tremolo, because these are a pain in the arse. This one's a standard strap trem, but I've put some uh, locking saddles on quite recently. Uh, these are the Wilkinson ones that are on the Pete Thorne guitar. I stole it mercilessly from Pete. Um, these things are awesome. Uh, so they just rule out the saddles as being a cause of tuning. There are still other causes of tuning problems. It's just not that anymore. Um, so you go over to the other end. Now these machine heads are the original fenders with the F on the back. Um, and I think there's room to be upgraded there. So I wouldn't feel it's like sacrilegious to get some locking tuners. Um, maybe the stagger could be different as well so that the angle of those strings is less severe on the nut. I know Eddie's guitar sounded like a sitar when he played it. You could hear all this pinging behind the nut. But as soon as you fretted it, that sound's gone. So, you know, the guy made his choice and, and it bloody worked. Um, so that's it, you just keep it lubricated with pencil lead. It's just a normal nut, this is. At one point I had a Floyd on it, um, and I decided that wasn't the way to go for this guitar, but John Diggins put the wood back in right here, like it had never been turned into a Floyd guitar, which is, he's just a genius. Him and his son put the guitar back together and filled in a bit of wood here and resprayed it. So that's John Diggins in the UK in Birmingham. Uh, absolute master guitar guy. There's the back of the guitar and that's the cutaway. Pretty sexy, no? Yeah. So anyway, um, I mentioned before, this pickup's made by uh, Jalen Pickups and it's called an Origin, I believe. It's quite a low wind, it's maybe the 7.8 type of thing, like, like path wind. Um, and the volume control, which says tone, uh, is 250k, as mentioned before, uh, but that's cool because it just bleeds a little bit of the treble off and just uh, brings it into the brownie zone. see the pedal set up. Got the EVH flanger. Phase 90. On 
Kennedy setting. Got Digitech Freak Out, which is very cool, gives me some feedback. <laughs> And the Echo Plex pedal. Okie dokie, so let's have a look at the amps. There's my little stack of uh, sound toys. Let's go in for a closer look. So we're using the Bray 50 as the first amp, it's called the Bray Coco 50 and you can see the settings there output most of the way up bass is knocked back a bit, middle's sort of yeah you can see what's going on there and I'm going into the low input because it seems to react better with the reamp at the moment with the, with the slave amp okay now there are two volumes on here a bit like two channels on a Marshall, um, one of the channels is a bit treblier and one is a bit bassier and in this case volume one is a bit treblier, a bit more aggressive and volume two is a little bit spongier and a bit more naturalistic. So those are the, those are the controls. Now from the back this speaker lead comes out and it goes into the Bray load box, low one. The speaker lead continues to a real speaker, so I'm not using a load on this, I'm actually using a real speaker to pass the sound. And then on the top here, this is a line out, and the line out goes into the back of the D75 power amp. Right, so this is an all valve power amp built by Aspen Pittman in the 90s and you get two sides, it's like a stereo, so you get the left and right, or channel one, channel two, but you can see how I've got the thing set up. Okay, and uh, then that goes out to a 412. Here's the cab room, this is where my speaker cabs live. Have a look at the miking here. Let's try and bring this one home. So if you want to get the brown sound, there's only one piece of equipment you need, and that's a time machine, because you need to go and nick all of Ed's gear back in 77, and book into Sunset Sound in the same period with Don and Ted, 
and used tape from the same period, and everyone knows the mains sounded better in those days. But seriously, any gear that you're going to get today won't be Ed's gear. It's not going to do the same thing, but it'll do something pretty close, hopefully. Your job is then to balance the tonal aspects until you're getting exactly the right special source. I hope that makes sense. That's it for now. I'll be back on more videos, hopefully, if you'll have me. Um, different sounds, probably loads more Ed as well. So for now, keep chasing that tone. <laughs>